We are ready. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today for the first episode of Sea to Sparks. We're thrilled you're here. I'm the moderator for today. My name is Lauren LaGreca, and I'm the marketing manager here at CETA. And CETA, for those of you who don't know, is the Cuga Economic Development Agency. And we are your one stop for economic development here in Cuga County. We provide businesses with easy access to all of the information, incentives, and resources that are needed to start or grow a business in Cuga County. So whether you're launching your idea, you're looking to grow, or you're transitioning out of your business, we'll meet you where you are on your business journey. So CETA Sparks is about the three E's. It's educating, it's engaging, and it's empowering all small business owners and of course our CETA supporters throughout the county. CETA Sparks is a new initiative that we're launching here at CETA. It's all about um, bringing you information in bite-sized pieces and in a format that you can revisit whenever you need to. It's another way to keep CETA's resources right inside your business toolbox. So we know the world of economic development is all acronyms, right? Everything stands for something else. Um, our first episode out of the gate focuses on understanding DEI, which stands for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Our guest speaker for today will define what this means for you and your business so you can understand the why behind DEI and the steps you can take to implement this into your workplace culture. Our host for today's episode is my colleague, Maureen Reister. Hi, Maureen. Hi. He is Economic Development Specialist. So just a few more housekeeping notes before I turn it over to Maureen. If you have any questions during today's presentation, please type them directly to me in the chat box. Um, if you submit a question, we won't mention your name or your business unless you reference them in your question. And we'll look to answer them, time permitting, after the presentation today during the Q&A. The presentation today is being recorded and currently being recorded. Um, so you can reference it after today's um, presentation and share it with anyone who maybe couldn't attend today. Um, attendees are muted and we do ask that you stay muted for the duration of the presentation, but you can certainly turn your video on. I'm sure our presenter will appreciate seeing your faces. Um, now we'll turn this over to Maureen, who will introduce herself and today's guest speaker, Dr. Rhoda Overstreet. Thank you so much, Lauren. Hello, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Maureen Reister, and I am CETA's Economic Development Specialist. You may be asking, what does that mean? Well, I work with the larger businesses that will have a significant investment, and they usually create or retain jobs. These are the types of projects that are eligible for the incentives on a larger scale in the regional, state, or federal levels. I also have a counterpart, Paul Vigiano, our small business development specialist who works closely with entrepreneurs and small business owners by supporting them with the services and resources they need. These services would include market research, business planning, financial projections, and marketing strategies, and all the other professional services that exist in our entrepreneurial ecosystem. Thank you to all of you joining us this morning who have taken the time out of your busy day to learn more about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and why businesses need to be aware of its importance and impact for businesses now more than ever. We're very excited to be kicking off this new initiative called CETA Sparks. As Lauren shared, the purpose of this series is to discuss programs and topics that are important to sustain and grow any business. Right now, the format is virtual, but we'll keep you updated with any changes. We know how busy your schedule is and how valuable your time truly is so these episodes will be a high-level conversation of topics that are relevant and current and will resonate with what you are asking about and what we know that you need to know. If you need further information on any topic, you'll know who to reach out to, us. So what can you expect? Each episode will begin with a presentation by our presenter, followed by some questions and answers, all of which will be recorded and shared later on all of CETA's social outlets. However, by joining Sparks Live after the recorded portion, you'll have more time to ask any other questions, including anything you might wanna ask when it's not being recorded. We'll also open it up for any questions you might have for our CETA staff, and our staff can also give an update about anything else going on in Cuyahoga County that you should know about. If there's a topic that interests you, please email us or just put it in the chat. So without any further delay, I would like to 
welcome our first presenter, an Auburn native, Dr. Overstreet Wilson, who is a distinguished educator, social justice advocate, and community leader with over 25 years of providing vision and strategic strategies focused on change management and organizational development through the lens of diversity, equity, and inclusion for numerous nonprofit organizations and community boards. As a sociology professor at Cuga Community College, Dr. Overstreet Wilson has established herself as a lifelong learner of society's constructs that create barriers for equity and inclusion in organizations. Dr. Overstreet Wilson believes DEI is not a singular conversation. She is committed to provo promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion in her personal and professional life. Dr. Overstreet Wilson is the board president of the Booker T. Washington Community Center, the vice president of the Auburn Cuga branch of the NAACP, an Auburn Human Rights Commissioner, and an Auburn Enlarged City School District Board member. She also serves on several other boards in the community for the purpose of advocacy and representation. Dr. Overstreet Wilson is married to Roy Wilson and they have two adult children and two grandchildren. Dr. Overstreet Wilson received her doctorate in executive leadership with a minor in social justice from St. John Fisher. In addition to all of that, she is also running for Auburn City Council this fall. She's surely shaping the history in her own hometown. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today to educate us on the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion in today's business environment. The floor is all yours. Alrighty. Well, I first wanna thank um, Maureen and her team here at CETA for this invitation. Um, I'm honored to be the first presenter of this new series on CETA Sparks. Um, the assistance that this team provides to our community business um, and now this topic of DEI, because it's so important to me, I'm honored that I was asked. So when Maureen approached me, my company, to be a part of the new initiative, she asked if I would discuss DEI and its relevance to, um, to the business development and also to your business growth. I was excited because that signaled to me that CETA was forward thinking. And being a black woman that was born and raised here, I believe that I had some lived experiences that I could share, feeling a bit at times exclu um, excluded, which, is, which definitely drove my passion to want to, um, to form my company. So I believe our business areas have had some missed opportunities that may not be felt now, but they'll be felt in the future. So I'll start now with good morning to everyone. I hope everyone has had an opportunity to enjoy this weather. We all know living in upstate New York, it's hot today, but it could be winter tomorrow. So I do hope that you enjoy the rest of the weekend. When my grandmother was aging, I wanna start with a story. When my grandmother was aging, she would say this phrase over and over again. And my cousins and I kind of picked it up. We would kind of laugh about it, but I'll be honest with you. I, I miss it. I miss her saying it. But this is what she would say. She would say, it's so good to see you. Thank you for coming by, sugar. Now, you could be any place else in the world, but you chose here to, you chose to be with me today. So any of us would kind of look at each other, but I would kind of laugh and nod and I'd walk over and I'd say, hi, grandma. I would kiss her on the forehead. But when I got to thinking about it, I thought that is, that's a pretty powerful statement and it did make me feel special. So I want to extend that gratitude to you all this morning without asking any of you to come and give me some sugar, but you could have been any place else today and you chose to be here with myself and to see the sparks. And I thank you very much for that. So what is EID Blueprint? It's my company. And I chose to name it EID because I thought when, when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, that's a mouthful. And many organizations are using that. They're actually putting other acronyms together. But when I was starting to think about it, I thought if we address as a business community, if we address the equity and the inclusion, by default, the reward will be diversity. So in my consulting company, I consult and train on the discipline of leadership. <clears throat> I again, I believe if we address those inequities and those inclusions and those exclusions here, specifically in Auburn, our community will adapt to the changes that we're seeing in our society. What does DEI mean as a discipline? 
DEI is any policy or practice designed to make people of various backgrounds feel welcome in your area. They are there to ensure that you have support for them so that they can perform their job responsibilities to their fullest capabilities. As a business owner, you wanna create the culture where the people you hire can take on the job that you have offered them, that they can do it in such a way that it impacts your economic bottom line. So a quick breakdown to each of those words, diversity are the differences within any given setting, but in the workplace, they are the differences between race, ethnicity, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, age, and socioeconomic background. Equity is the act of ensuring that processes and programs are impartial and fair, and they provide an equitable and equal opportunity for all to participate. Inclusion is the practice of making people feel a sense of belonging in the workplace. As a business owner, as you think about how your business is, is constructed, as you think about what it is that you are putting out because you are there to ensure that your consumers come back and they purchase this product, whatever it is that you have, you wanna make sure that everybody that you employ they feel as if they are welcomed in that space because if they're feeling that they're welcome, they'll be able to give that same feeling to the people that are walking through the door, excuse me, through the door or the people that they're having conversations with. It's the culture that you want to, to create. And there's some technology things going on here. I'm, I'm hitting next and it's not going. Perfect. All right, thank you. Why is DCI, DEI a necessary, uh, necessary conversation? It's necessary because Auburn in the county is experiencing growth. DEI is not only a social conversation, it's an economic one as well that has been looming in specifically in our county for a decade or for decades. The demographic landscape and culture of our region is changing. CETA is collaborating with the city to bring in new companies to our area. There's a new company that's gonna be starting over on Grand Ave down here on the West End. There's a bunch of urban renewal going on. So that signifies to the entire community, Auburn is changing. Auburn is embracing a period of growth. Auburn is embracing a period of development. The marketing, specifically, the marketing of the, the tourist attractions here in Cuba County is very intentional. And I want to give credit to where credit is due because that Office of Tourism, the Cuba County Office of Tourism, understands that there is an economic impact if we bring folk in, if we if we look at what Auburn stands for in respect to our history of this country, we're, we're looking at the opportunity for all businesses to, to, to have an, um, an impact on their bottom line if those, new, if those new tourists come in. The other one thing that I wanna share with you specifically about the um, tourism that is happening is that there are several conversations about conferences that different businesses and organizations want to have in this community. So if we look at two or 300 different people coming into our community, we're looking at places for those people to stay. We're looking at places for those people to eat. We're looking at places for those people to actually purchase products. And these aren't people that are gonna be specifically from Auburn. These are gonna be people that are from around the state, around the country. We've had tour groups that have come from other countries. So we want to be ready for when those people come to our community that we are ready to embrace whatever diverse thinking that they have, whatever diversity looks like to them. We want to be ready for that. Last fall, there was a, a conference that took place and it was a, a, a fantastic conference. But one of the overarching themes was there's no place to eat here. Where exactly are we going to go? We have 50 people that want to eat. Do we separate ourselves and go to different places? What are the chain um, restaurants that are here? So what ended up happening for like two of those nights is 
those folks took their dollars to other communities. Those folks spent money, probably thousands of other, other dollars in other communities. When they came back, the conversations that I heard were, well, if even if we did stay here, what type of food would they have? Even if we did stay here, are the restaurants big enough to have accommodated us? So I'm starting to think, here we go. It's another um, DEI topic that we need to address. As tourism booms, as business booms, people coming in and out of Auburn aren't going to look like everybody that is currently sitting at the table. We're gonna to need to be in a mindset of embracing not just new ideas and concepts, but embracing those new ideas and concepts from people that may not look like us. Auburn is ready to present itself as diverse. One of the reasons that come to mind for me when I think about that is that Auburn is making history. We currently have our first African-American legislator that, that has been um, voted in by the people. And we're talking about almost 300 years of Auburn being Auburn itself. I've been, myself a black woman, I've been voted onto the school board twice. That's history. Again, almost 300 years in the making. That means our culture is changing. The way in which Auburn, the way in which our region thinks about the people that are in its community, the people that are coming to its community, we're changing that, we're thinking about that. And we need to make sure that our business, both small and large, are on the same path, because if not, then those economic opportunities are gonna be gone. Also, I wanna point out is we have a thriving wine industry. I have a couple girlfriends that have actually left this area. And when they do come home, they're always talking about the different wine tours that could be taken. And they would say, Rhoda, when we were growing up, those weren't, those weren't there. Those weren't there, Rhoda. And when you think about it, you think wine country must be California, but it's not. Our region is getting ready for the changes that we see in our society. The business owners cannot ignore as business owners, you can't ignore the changes. Otherwise, you're going to lose that opportunity. If we look at the change in demographics, we know that the average age um, for an upstate New Yorker is, is 39. So that says to me that our young people are graduating and leaving. Sitting on the school board, I do know that over like 150 of those students that are graduating this year have already chosen to leave, they have already chosen to apply to colleges outside of this area, which means all of that know-how and knowledge and that excitement and that youth and that, and that vitality is leaving. That also signifies to me that what is left here in Auburn is a pool of employees that are being regenerated from one company to another company, one company to another company. And if anything that COVID should have taught us is that we had a pool of staff that we were overworking and they were choosing to jump to whatever company, whatever business, whatever organization was offering them the most in terms of money, but was offering them also a feeling in a sense of welcoming, a feeling in a sense of I belong there. So again, as business owners here, we have to be cognizant that as our young people are graduating and leaving, whom are we going to be stuck with? Whom? And I don't mean stuck in a bad way. I mean stuck in the sense of are we going to be doing the same dance three years from now, five years from now, 10, ten years from now? unless we look at the changes that are taking place, unless we look at the intentionality of the tourism that is happening, the intentionality of the businesses that are booming, and also the intentionality of the economic um, investments that are gonna be taking place in this community. When, when money is being invested into an area, we know that that comes with diversity. We know that it comes with not with just diversity of thinking and thought that's going to come with diversity of people, age, that's come um, sexual identity, it's going to come with ethnicity, different races. As an area, there's an opportunity to not just impact our bottom line, but to see our bottom line grow. 
become stable, to see our bottom line, be able to develop new product for us. That's the opportunity. Because the reason the region is changing, our history predicts it, and it's not going to ask for permission. It's not. One of the things as business owners we need to think about is aesthetically, does our business reflect the changes that we see in society? When folks walk through the door, can they see themselves? When folks are on the phone, can they hear themselves in the salesperson on the other line? When folks are coming to look at contracts and sign contracts, is there anybody in that building that looks like them? I'll share a story with you. My husband here works at a, a job at a large company, and this job would be considered one of the really good jobs in this area. And in fact, growing up, this company was often talked about at different kitchen tables, like, that's the job that you want. That's the job that you want. So it is a large company, and my husband is African-American, and he would be in what I consider like the, the service part of that, of that company. So he's in the customer service area. So anytime anybody enters that building, he is one of the first persons that is seen. So he would come home and he would tell me, like, Rhoda, I got like four or five thumbs up. And I would say to him, because that's you're doing a good job. And he was like, yeah, I think I'm doing a good job. But it's more like, hey, it's somebody that looks like you here. I'm like, okay. And then there's two questions that I would ask him. I would say, well, how old were they? Well, how He would say, I don't know. I don't know. Like, how old did they look? He was like, I don't know, maybe like in their 30s. And then I would say, what, what color were they? And he was like, Rhoda, well, they're not always black. I'm like, I know. I said, the reason why I'm asking is, is because that is another signifier of change. We have young people who are working for industries, not just that are here in Auburn, but industries that are outside of this region that are coming here doing work with our local businesses that are young folk and young folk of different color, different backgrounds that are desiring to see the diversity in the companies that they are working with. So when I explained that to my husband, he was like, yeah, yeah, I, I definitely didn't think about it like that. I said, yes. I said, our young folk, those folks being under, under 40, those folks being under 30, they have a real concept of the changes that, that are coming. They really are taking the opportunity to acknowledge it. Those young folks that are building their businesses, they are taking that opportunity to build their businesses on diversity, equity, and inclusion because they know not just will it be more receivable, there is opportunity for economic advancement and also economic investment. Your reputation, it's an opportunity for your reputation to receive a huge boost. Think about it in this capacity. Those 200 people that were here in the, in the fall for this conference, if they could tell 200 other people that they had this experience in Auburn, in Cuga County, and those 200 people tell another 200 people, those are thousands of dollars that are going to come back specifically to our community. But if those 200 people tell another 200 people, there's no place to eat, there's no place to stay, people weren't really friendly, I'm not quite sure what we would do there because they don't have a lot to offer, then those people that are going to come here specifically for our, histor um, our, histor our history and our tours, they're going to take those tours and leave. And all of those monies are going to leave our community. The other thing that I should add is the people that are coming to visit aren't just considered <clears throat> people that are, <clears throat> excuse me, um, people that have retired or people that are just taking vacations. We're talking about people that are that own their own businesses, they own their own companies, they own their own their own organizations. So they're coming to look not just to have a nice time in Harriet Tubman's chosen hometown, but they're coming to scout areas to do businesses to do business as well. And as Auburn, we want to always put our best foot forward. So having that reputation of, of being welcoming and feeling inclusive, having that reputation that your, your employees look like the people that are walking through the door, that's definitely the reputation that you want. But it all boils down to economic stability. Like I said, if those 200 people tell 200 other people, we're looking at six, seven, 10, $12,000 in a day. 
in a day. That's the type of business that you want to have. That's the type of business that you definitely want to run, but that's the type of business that you want to make sure that you are taking the opportunity to look and assess the changes that are happening so that you can get ready. So what does this mean? It means that diversity matters. Diversity matters. If we look at all of the, all of the statistics, the makeup of the entire country is over 50% women. And if we look in the next 10 or 15 years, that number is probably gonna raise close to like 58 or 59% of all of our societal folks being, being women. We're also looking at the increased number of um, race and ethnicity, those folks that are identifying by their race or by their ethnicity is changing. History is, history is gonna repeat itself and the change is not gonna ask for anybody's permission. So a diverse workforce mirrors that you have an understanding of those societal changes. And you also understand that there are opportunities afforded to you for your business. A diverse workforce creates a welcoming experience. You want people to walk through the door and leave feeling not just full, not just heard, not just with a sense of, well, that was a really good eye, you know, a really good experience. You want them to feel like we want you to come back. We not only want you to come back because we're glad that you're spending money, but we are glad that you chose us. Out of every other business, out of every other region that you could have gone to, you chose us. And we're thankful for that. A diverse staff brings different perspectives to the table. If everybody sitting at the table looks exactly like you, you're going to be the same three years, five years, seven years, and 10 years from now. I shared with you early on that having lived experiences of feeling excluded in this community can may not feel have an impact now, but it will have an impact in the future. You never know what somebody's skill set can bring to the ability of strategizing. You never know what somebody's skill set can bring to when we're looking at solving a problem. So kind of getting out of our head of what Something, getting out of our head of what fitting looks like. Does that person fit? If we, if we remove that from any of our conversations, we'll definitely be more open to looking at a person's character and looking, and looking at what a person can bring actually to that position. And a diverse workforce can slow turnover. When you have the ability to hire and you're in that mindset, I'm going to hire those folks that have the right character, they have the right skill set, and you're not looking for fit, then you're opening your, your business to everybody that wants a job, anybody that is employable. And you're not looking for just that standard, this tall, this weight, this color, this educational background. You're looking at the entire pot or the entire pool as an opportunity to make sure that your business, again, reflects what you as a business owner, what you think and what you say. But it's also going to save you money, the loss of productivity. When you have to retrain people, when you have to buy um, new training materials, when you have to buy more product, that those are all lost dollars. What blocks this growth is bias. Now bias occurs both intentionally and unintentionally. We all have it, we all have it, but still both impacts your judgment and my judgment, our decision-making and our behaviors. We know these as societal stereotypes. Those stereotypes, they are about certain groups of people that can and will hurt your business bottom line. So I have a, a short video that I would like to show you. I'm going to go to the next slide. So hopefully this will work. Please bear with me. So I need to bear. I'm going to hit not yet. I got to hit play. Thank you all for bearing with me. play. Can you all see this? Yeah. Do it with just about everyone we meet. We label people according to stereotypes. And often 
don't even know we're doing it. We make snap judgments every day at home, at work. All based on how someone looks or speaks or what little information we know of them. I have all the information. Sure. I have a good rest of your day. Bye. Hi, Michaela. Good morning, Janine. Say, I want to talk to you about your new hairstyle. It's really not appropriate for work. Your natural look is, well, unprofessional. <coughs> unprofessional? So, you're telling me that I can't wear my naturally curly hair curly? Well. I loved your presentation. Well, thank you very much. Very informative. And you speak so well. <laughs> You're so articulate. Well, my girlfriend thinks we can clean out our garage in one weekend. I told her in her dreams. But that's the plan. Wait. You're a lesbian. I mean, you don't look like a lesbian. Great place. You're going to love it here, Beth. I'm excited to be part of the team. So, where are you from, Trisha? Oh, I have a nice short commute. I'm from Garden Park. No, <laughs> I meant where are you from originally? Bias can be harmful when it's fueled by stereotypes or when we use it to validate our thinking. When you find yourself making an assumption or judgment about someone, use STEP, which stands for stop, think, explore, and prepare. Addressing bias. Thank you, Maureen. Addressing bias. Change is scary. It's scary for all of us. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what it is that you're looking at changes. As human beings, we like things to be a certain way. That's why we all have routines. That's why there are tons of books and articles written about routine, why routines are important because of change. We don't know what to expect. We don't know what it will look like, how it will have an impact. And when we're definitely talking about changing in our workplace, immediately senses are, are heightened. How will I take care of my family if I can't keep my job? How will I take care of my family if I don't get along with whatever it is that these changes are? So all of that is going to produce some anxiety. But addressing biases, it is one of the most important things as a business owner that you should do. And I'm not saying that you must do because as business owners, you have that choice, but it's what you should do. You think about your economic stability. You think about your economic growth plan, that strategic growth plan. This is something that you're definitely going to need to address. Um, so address, evaluating those current internal operations, do they work? Who sits on certain committees? Is there somebody on a committee that you know is kind of kind of goofy, but in a very kind of offsetting kind of way? And you for a long time just kind of like, oh, that's Rhoda. We don't really need to worry about that. What is that creating though? Is that creating a barrier to growth? Have you taken a look at your policies? Do you want to policies create a checks and balance? When you're looking at policies and, proced and procedures, and you're also looking at those internal processes, you want to partner with your HR department. Your HR department not only is there to protect the organization, it's there to protect the employees, but they're also going to know about state regulations and federal laws. That's that definite team that you're going to want to have when you, when you form your committee, when you are addressing structural changes within your organization. Looking at training. Training, like I said earlier, this conversation isn't a one and done. Training isn't a one and done thing. That's why there are expectations of every year that there should be updates in some organizations, in some companies as a business owner, profit or nonprofit, you want to keep your team to a routine. There are certain things that you want to train. You want to build that so that your staff have capacity, not just to deal with the current responsibilities, but the responsibilities that you know that are coming. And restructuring, I said that earlier, that could be the part that's not just scary for your employees, but scary for you. How do you restructure your organization when it's been like this for 10, 15, 20 years? How do you restructure your organization when you're really good friends, maybe with that hiring manager? 
when maybe you're even related to that hiring manager. But you know, as a business owner, when you take a look at your economic growth plan, that that person might be creating a barrier to growth and development. Change management. A part of what my company does also is we, I train and consult through what change management should look like. And one of the first things that I say is it's your, it's your business. You got to keep your eye on your business goal. All of the employees that you have, you definitely want to make them feel welcome. You want to make them feel appreciative, uh, that you're appreciative of the job that they do. You want to make sure that they know that without them, this job would be hard to do. But at the end of the day, it is your business. All of your initiatives need to be discussed with your employees, your, your stakeholders, and your consumers. You want to look for those team members that you know might be a little adverse to, to change, you wanna get them onto the team. You wanna get them onto the committee. You wanna help engage them into conversations about why the changes are happening. And the changes may not necessarily be structural at first, but it may be a change in philosophy. It may be a change in the information that you are sharing, that you're displaying. And you wanna have that open and honest communication with your employees. All of your initiatives should be written down. It should be written down and disseminated. It should be a part of the training that you conduct. It should, in terms of um, training, it should also be a part of the training where it's trained, but you're also asking your employees to sign off that they have been trained and that they under they understood what was the information that was given to them. Again, partner with human resources. Um, and any of the changes that you make know that those aren't just written in stones. You as your as the business owner, you as part of the leadership team, there are going to be changes in the philosophy of leadership. There's going to be changes in the philosophy of change management. There are going to be changes in the philosophy and the way in which you, you operate your business. That also should be something that you're telling your employees. This is the way we're going to do it now, but something could come up and this may need to change later. You also need to practice what you are saying and what you have written down. All of us can, all of us have examples of your boss telling you to do one thing, but that is not what you're seeing that person do, even though they're saying it, even though they may even be holding other people accountable. You can look from where you're sitting or from your platform and say, we're being told to do this, but but leadership isn't doing that. It really is important to be the change. You represent the change that you desire to see. So my recommendations for all of these changes, for any of these conversations, for any of the trainings that you that you personally would, would like to have at your organization, you want to first have a processing partner that can be honest with you. I recommend that it not be an employee of yours. You want somebody to be able to tell you that what you're saying doesn't make sense. You want somebody to be able to tell you um, that might be against the law. You may want to look into that more. And you want somebody to be able to tell you that if you do not make this change, this is what could happen. And put you first. Get your employee buy-in. Engage your leaders and stakeholders. Form a committee. Form a committee, an internal committee. You have your outside processing partners and you have an internal committee that you're gonna hold one another accountable. You're gonna do all of your strategic thinking. You're gonna communicate what it is that you're gonna to communicate to the layers outside of you. And you're gonna make sure that each of those folks on your committee that they have bought in and understand that DEI is measured in tangible action and change. You can have initiatives, you can write those initiatives down, you can say and repeat those initiatives, but if you have goals in your business, your, your company, your organization looks no different in a year, then you have not met those goals. If your goal is to change the way in which the makeup of your employee base is, it needs to change. If your goal is to change the way in which your training is being disseminated, it needs to change. If your goal is to engage new opportunities for business contracts, that's the change that needs to be seen. So um, I'm going to end there, and I do want to thank you all for 
um, being here this morning. Again, you could have been any place else, but you chose to be here with myself and Sita. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Street Wilson. That was very thorough, and I think we can all agree it's just the tip of the iceberg, right? There's so much more um, to really talk about, and it sparked a few more questions for me. It, um, but to be mindful of time, we'll 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 look at those for a later date. Um, and anticipate we'll have some more questions coming through post presentation, for sure. And Dr. Overstreet Wilson, can I just ask one question? Yeah. Um, you know, what is the best way to communicate DEI efforts internally and then also externally? So when I think of internally, I'm thinking of your employees or perhaps board members, and externally, your customers or suppliers. I would say from all of the research um, that I've done, but also participated in change management in the organizations that I've worked in. You as the you as the leader, the owner, the president, the CEO, the vice president, you can't do it alone. It is not a job to be done alone. You do need to form a committee. And if you have a committee of two, three, four, five, every person on that committee needs to be saying the same thing. How you communicate it is not just verbally, you communicate it through literature, you communicate it through email, you, in your daily conversations, you may wanna talk about the changes that are coming. You wanna get your board buy-in, you wanna get your stakeholder buy-in, you wanna get your consumers to buy-in. But as you're having these conversations, your environment needs to look like the changes that you're talking about. And it's not a one and done, it's continual. So I'm looking at the time. I want to be mindful of everyone's um, time, but I just want to ask one more quick one of, you know, what are some good resources that businesses can tap into for more information? Well, I'll first say I'm available to be a resource. I do live here in Auburn and we should, as business owners, we should always support one another. We want to keep our dollars in the community. We never want to drive our dollars outside of the community. I can also share with you that when you are doing research, um, you want to look for what we would call um, scholarly sites, because those sites, that information has been vetted, not just in terms of being read and reread, that information has been researched thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of times. Um, time. So there's fidelity to those models that you're looking at. But I also think that creating the opportunity to have an outside, again, an outside consultant um, come in and kind of take on that, those first initial steps because that person can also help guide you, your leadership team through the processes and the steps that it's gonna take um, to make those changes. Yeah, I think you have one more slide. Oh, do I have one more slide? <laughs> oh, my references. Yes, these are the scholarly sites that I use because it really is important to me to um, make the second disclaimer. These are not my words. These are my interpretation of the information that I have studied for years. So in, all, in forming my own business and then becoming an LLC, I was able to take that information, form it into my own words. But this is after reading thousands and thousands of articles of articles and also completing a doctorate on this information as well. So I have two slides available. And then there's me. Well, I think at this time we're going to be wrapping up the recorded portion of CETA Sparks, episode one on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thank you so much, Dr. Overstreet Wilson, and to Lauren, our moderator. If there are any other topics that you'd like us to consider for future episodes, please send us a message in the chat or reach out to one of CETA specialists through our website, kiugaeda.org. Thank you so much.